uh, ready to get going here. Um, welcome everybody that's listening in. Uh, my name is James Yoakum, and I'm uh, going to talk today about exit strategies for your your DSP, your distilled spirits plant. Um, so th I think the uh, you know we'll go through the slides here. Uh, if you have any questions along the way, I'd very much be happy to answer questions. I think there's a Q and A button. You can just throw those in there, and I will try to try to get to your questions um, whenever it, it makes sense. So um, first off, a little bit about me. Um, so you can kind of make a decision if you want to listen to what I had to say here. Uh, I am a currently an attorney at Kleinbard um, here in Philadelphia. We're a Philadelphia law firm, about 50 attorneys. We do everything from litigation to you know corporate transactions, like what we're going to be talking about today. Um, but some of my background, I grew up in Kentucky, uh, um, came to Philadelphia to go to college, and I've been here for um, a solid, you know, almost 20 years or so. It's uh, it's getting up there. So I've been in Philly um, as long as I was in Kentucky. And I'm not from the bourbon part of Kentucky, but I uh, it still bought me some street cred when I was distilling. Um, after college, I sold real estate for a while in Philly during the financial crisis kind of era, 07 to maybe 2013 or so, um, which is good business training generally. And then at some point I decided... Uh, that I wanted to open a craft distillery. I uh, wanted to make bourbon it was the the driving you know desire behind it. And it really was kind of one of those dream businesses where I had a dream and an idea and decided to chase it. So opened uh, Cooper River Distillers in Camden, New Jersey in 2014. We were the second legal distillery in New Jersey since Prohibition. Um, so we were always you know pretty happy about that. Um, but being early in the state meant a lot of uphill battles in terms of getting legislation changed, getting, you know, the rules written and kind of breaking through some of that early stuff. I think New Jersey now has, you know, over 30, almost 40 craft distilleries going. So it's come a long way over there in, in New Jersey. Um, while running the distillery, because it was a, you know, startup situation, um, early phases, I uh, went to law school as I guess you could say a backup plan, kind of crazy, but I was going to law school at night while running the distillery, which was a lot. And uh, I'll talk in a minute about kind of my process of closing and selling my distillery um, and that, you know, we'll weigh in on that. So 2018, I uh, got my law degree and decided to close the distillery, which I, like I said, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second to kind of give you some background on my experience, which may be helpful. Um, but I like to say it was, you know, successful, successful project in every way except paying myself. So that's kind of important too. Um, and then since 2018, I've been working as an attorney. I do a lot of commercial real estate work here at Kleinbard. I do some business and finance work. And then I work with some brewers, wineries, distillers, all the kind of beverage alcohol folks that have similar issues in their businesses. Um, and then the fun stuff, you know, I have two, two daughters, wife. I, we like all the outdoorsy stuff, cooking, traveling, all that drinking beer and whiskey, still fun. Um, don't really make it anymore. So, you know, we'd love to live vicariously through those of you out there making it. Um, a little CYA legal stuff. Um, the uh, every you know, I'll just say every distillery is different. Every business is different. So you know, I'm not going to give specific advice on your business today, but just general um, kind of background stuff. Um, business transactions are often about understanding risk, minimizing risk, but then still taking risk. So I think it's important to just keep that in mind uh, throughout. That you know, the key thing is to understand the risks you're taking. Always ask the questions you know, what am I, understand what you're doing and and ask as many questions as you need to of professionals that can help you get your head around it before you uh, jump into one of these sale type transactions. Um, and then, you know, a lot of this is based on my personal experience and themes I've observed. So, uh, you know, that only goes so far. Every one of these deals is different. So nothing that I'm going to say is tax or legal advice, and you should always talk to a qualified professional about your specific concerns. Uh, next up. The big question of why do you want to exit? So why do you want to sell your distillery? And I'm going to use the word exit throughout because, you know, a lot of times we're talking about selling a business, but sometimes we're just talking about shutting it down and walking away. Sometimes we're talking about something more like a partnership change. All, all these could be on the table and have similar um, considerations. So the why question is important to ask up front. There, uh, it's just important to know your own motivation and to be able to kind of clearly think about your motivation for why you're selling because that's gonna drive the rest of your sale process and a lot of your decisions. So some common scenarios of why people decide to sell, um, maybe you were approached by an unsolicited buyer, someone just comes up and says, hey, I wanna write you a check for your business. Um, that's 
rare. Um, and I like to say, you know, if that's going to happen to you, you probably see it coming. You probably know that you're the type of business that has gotten to that point and that people are sniffing around and interested. If it comes unexpectedly, you you might want to consider that you could be getting scammed or, you know, give it a little, give it a real close look. Um, and then, you know, if that happens, you want to say, you know, do I actually want to sell? Because you weren't thinking of selling and someone approached you. Ask yourself, am I even interested in entertaining this? Um, another scenario why you might want to exit is just the business isn't working out either financially, it's losing money, not making money, um, or personally, you have some other issues outside the business that make you want to stop running that business. Very common. Um, could be working out too well. Could be that the business is growing, that it's growing in ways you're not familiar with, you're not capable of uh, handling yourself, and you may need to bring in partners or sell to a larger you know, operation that can that can handle that growth or that change. Um, sounds like a good problem, but it still requires some of the same thought and navigation as as the more um, negative reasons to sell. And then, of course, there's emergency sales. You see businesses all the time that are going out of business um, for emergency reasons. They lost their lease, um, you know, illness of of a key person, something like that, which you know, are unexpected and may force you to do a lot of what I'm talking about in a condensed timeline. But um, even in that scenario, you want to try your best to, to be smart and approach things in this kind of systematic way. Um, so next up, uh, like I said, I'm going to give you a little background on my personal experience. Um, I think it's helpful. So it, it might be kind of a long story, um, but I, I'm hoping this kind of sets the stage for what I went through and will give you some background on, you know, maybe you'll send some commonalities and things you can uh, draw from this. So my story, like I said, I opened in 2014 as Cooper River Distillers in Camden. Uh, we were right there at the beginning of New Jersey craft distilling. So we we're making up stuff as we went along, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that type of business story. Um, we were making bourbon, rum, um, rye whiskey, brandies, a lot of weird whiskeys. Um, those were, you know, we we're making a lot of different things, but they were all things I was excited about. So um, I had a real vision for what I wanted to do. And I was stuck on that vision and hard headed. Um, I'm sure a lot of you can connect with that as well as entrepreneurs. Um, and, and so, you know, we got up and running and things were, were you know, going well. I think we started small, um, didn't have a lot of money didn't have experience in the industry. Like I said, I came from selling real estate before and just kind of learned everything as I went, um, had some good mentors and stuff, but you know, it was started small, partly out of necessity and partly out of, it, it made sense to start small and, and make sure this works before, before going bigger. Um, so over the, you know, four or five years that we were open, I spent time running the business, growing the business. Uh, we had products out in a bunch of stores and bars and restaurants around New Jersey, some in Pennsylvania, even a little bit down in Delaware, Maryland. We had our on-site tasting room, which was you know, you know successful, even though it was not part of my original business plan. So that was kind of one of those curveballs. Um, and I I really wanted to grow the business to to a next scale, which would have required a bunch of money, a few million dollars. Um, so big money that I didn't have. So I spent some time looking for that money for a few years. And then, you know, at some point didn't see the path for that investment coming in, um, at least not a path that involved running the business as the business I had initially started. You know, anything that would have worked would have been a huge change away from kind of my vision. So ultimately, you know, four years into this, um, got my law degree as I had been going to law school at night. Um, was pretty exhausted from that. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, juggling. And then, you know, kind of took a step back. Um, I had a young daughter at that point. Um, you know, my wife had been working and kind of carrying the financial load for the family. So it was one of those personal decisions of this business is working. I could keep pouring my time and effort and energy into it. That may work out. Or I could say, hey, here's a good point where, you know, I've kind of hit this milestone getting a law degree. Maybe I shift gears. So after a lot of thinking and talking to people, made that decision to, to shut down the distillery, shift gears. Um, and even that process was was not quick after that decision. So came to that decision, you know, tried to do it in a good, you know, controlled way. Cause I it wasn't that emergency type of, hey, we need to close tomorrow or getting kicked out, or it wasn't that type of thing. It was more of a decision of, hey, this is kind of working, kind of, you know, treading water, but I, I 
don't see the next step. So told my employees, hey, you know, we're going to be closing, you know, within the next four or five months. Please stick around and help out as much as you can. But I understand, go find other work. Um, you know, we we really kind of wound down gradually like that. And, you know, close, I think our official last day was a Kentucky Derby party. So May of 2018. And at that point, I still had a functioning distillery sitting there with all of our stuff in barrels, all of our equipment. And I, I did my best to try to sell it as a business that someone else could come in and run as a going concern. Um, I had lined up a job at a law firm at that point. So I knew I couldn't be there running the day to day, but I needed to hand it off to someone. Several people expressed interest, kicked the tires and you know went down that road a few times with different people and ultimately uh, did not find a buyer who was willing to come in, take it over, keep running it as is. Um, so two years later, everything sat for two years, kind of unused. You know, I'd occasionally sell some of our inventory to some of our customers at stores or bars. But for the most part, it sat there unused for two years. And uh, eventually, um, one of my former employees had gone to work at this Reckless Town Farm Distillery that you see their logo there, trying to give them a little plug because... Uh, my employee, Ben, went to work there, helped them get started. And then, you know, at some point I was talking to him, we remained friendly. And I say, hey, Ben, would you guys want to just take over all the stuff we have in barrels, take our equipment and help me to kind of close that book after two years of not finding a kind of a going concern buyer. And by that point, he had helped them get off the ground for the two years. Um, so they were kind of up and running and they said, yeah, you have, you know, whiskey and rum and spirits that have been aging for two years, just sitting there and it's an extra two years of age that they didn't have. So they were excited to take over the spirits. I convinced them to also take all the remaining equipment and to give that a home. And it worked out well that they, you know, they bought all of our stock, took it. They've continued to bottle. Um, they've used some of our branding to continue to sell those spirits. And really, they tell a nice story of, hey, this stuff started somewhere else, came here, kind of a continuum. Happy, happy ending. And uh, it also, you know, I'm still friends with all those guys. So it gives me a chance to kind of keep in touch. So that that's how my story worked out. Not, you know, not cut and dry, not simple, but I think that's often the case that things take a winding kind of road and you end up hopefully somewhere that works. Um, I will say one crazy thing about that story is my inventory and everything sitting in that space for two years required my landlord to be very patient. So, you know, I had a landlord who didn't have a lot of other interest in the building they knew that me selling that inventory was the only way to get any money for it eventually. So they were willing to give me some time on that, um, which made that work. Um, if I had to just take everything out and throw it away, that would have been a lot of wasted value. So short little bit from my real estate side of my brain there. So that's my story. Um, moving on to kind of, if you're thinking of your story and, and how you wanna frame the why of why you might wanna exit your distillery business, um, I think this thought experiment around why it's really about getting your head around your own reasons. Um, and the biggest thing that you want to get out of that is, is what am I trying to do after, you know, am I hoping to stay involved in the business and just, you know, not be the sole owner anymore, not be the the guy who, you know, has to deal with every little thing. Is that your goal or is your goal to be completely removed? Um, like I said, in my scenario, I had a job lined up at a law firm. They expected me to be there every day working hard. I couldn't have too much, uh, you know, lingering responsibility to the um, to the distillery. So whatever happened, I had to be able to kind of walk away, which is different from, hey, I'm trying to sell this and remain on as a consultant or as a employee, something like that. Um, so, yeah, so I just have a note here that walking away is very different to you and also to a buyer. It's it's a different proposition all around if you're trying to sell the business and and walk away versus you're going to hang around as an employee or even as a consultant or any in any kind of role. Um, so that's something you need to answer for yourself, I guess, as you start thinking about this. Um, the next question. So we've talked about why are you selling? You're going to think through that. You're going to come up with an answer of why you're selling. It's going to help inform some of the rest of this. Next question is why you're selling or what you're selling. Um, so the what is, you know, you might think oh, I'm selling a distillery. Cool. Sounds simple. But that, you know, there's a lot of nuance around that. And I will say, I wish I had put a slide after this about buyers. So real quick uh, slide I didn't put, but I will mention two, or I'll mention three things about buyers, because obviously you're thinking of being the seller. Um, at least that's who this presentation is geared for is potential sellers. Um, but the other side of that coin is a buyer. Every transaction, there's there's 
you know, seller and a buyer, or, you know, maybe you're bringing in an investor, but at any, at any rate, there's someone on the other side looking at this. Um, and I think there's a couple things just about the types of different buyers that, that will play into the what. Um, so you'll hear, you know, if you're talking to a lawyer like me or a business broker or anyone in this kind of world of buying and selling businesses, you'll hear about strategic buyers versus financial buyers. So I think it's just important to give you a quick two seconds on those. Um, a strategic buyer is going to be someone who already has some sort of business, probably related, similar industry, and they see your business as plugging into their existing operation in some strategic way um, to where it's, you know, one plus one equals more than two, um, where it's, you know, they're going to have a, a more than just adding your business on. It's going to play with their other lines of business in some creative strategic way. So that's a strategic buyer. Maybe it's like a restaurant group that owns a bunch of restaurants and they want to own a distillery to supply their restaurants or something like that would be a strategic buyer. Um, another a common one would be a landlord that owns a building and wants to buy something to be a tenant because they have a hard time having their building used and they just say, why don't I just own this distillery that's then going to be my tenant in my building? Um, those are the kind of things to think about there. Uh, a financial buyer, on the other hand, is purely looking at your business as an investment to make money. Um, maybe not purely, but that's their that's their main criteria is, hey, I want to buy a business. I want to work that business and I want it to, to make an income, make money for me. Um, so that could be an individual. It could be like a private equity fund, anything like that, where they're really just looking at your numbers as a standalone business, not thinking about tying it into their larger ecosystem of businesses. So that's a financial buyer versus strategic. Just kind of important in terms of they look for different things. So you'll want to know which one you're most likely to talk to. Also, I think in this world, there's a third underappreciated type of buyer, which is like an ego buyer that just wants to own a distillery because they're cool. Um, those guys are out there and gals, um, they're rare, but if you find one, they can be a, a great option. So the next thing, next slide is now we're going to get into really what you're selling. So keep those buyer types in mind as we talk about this. Um, so part one of what you're selling is, is the legal question. So this is what, you know, as an attorney, when we're talking about, you know, what are they selling? This is kind of what the attorneys tend to be thinking. The what of what's the thing that's changing hands. Um, most lawyers are going to say that there's kind of two options. There's an all asset sale where you're selling everything your business owns, but not necessarily selling the like the business entity, the LLC, the corporation. Um, you're selling the assets. That's typically seen as best for the buyer. Uh, mostly because the buyer is getting all the assets of the business. They can put those in their own LLC and start running the business, but they're ditching and leaving behind any liabilities that the former LLC or uh, corporation might have had. So you kind of get to draw a stark line. Hey, before this date, the liabilities stay with the seller. Afterwards, um, the buyer's got a clean slate. Um, so that's usually buyer friendly to do an all asset sale. Um for sellers, the seller might want to sell the actual entity, the LLC, the corporation. They want might want to push that to the buyer and say, take it and deal with all the past liabilities or whatever might be, you know, kind of buried in the closet. So that's a negotiation to have. And there's a lot of, you know, different variables to consider there. It's when you'll want to talk through with your uh, attorney. Um, and then I think it's also a little bit muddier when we're talking about these DSPs, these heavily regulated licensed entities. Um, because in some states, you can't transfer the license that easily. If you do an asset sale, um, you, it might be worth doing the full business sale just to make the license transfer easier. That's going to depend a lot on state law regulation, um, state by state. So something to consider. Um, and then I, I just like to say, you know, when you're thinking about that, that part of what the legal, what are you selling? Uh, you'll hear a lot of creative solutions thrown about. People will pitch all sorts of ideas. Um, they're worth listening to. But definitely, you know, lean on your people who have been through this before, your accountants, your attorneys, uh, lean on them for kind of explaining what your liabilities are going to be, because it is important. It sounds, you know, I'm talking about, hey, you might be assuming the seller's liability. That might sound innocuous. It might be innocuous, but if it comes back to bite you, it hurts. So worth thinking about. Well, the other thing state, you know, with these state regulated entities, there's a lot of regulation around who can own um, these licenses. So I like to just say very early in the process, if you're talking to a buyer, find out if they have any other interests in alcohol businesses, because um, generally most states are going to say you can't own a distillery and a beer distributor or a distillery and a 
you know, retail liquor license in the same person. They're going to create some hurdles there, um, which you can hopefully work around, but you know, you want to know that you're going to have to jump through those extra hoops early rather than finding out at the last second. Uh, and then still on what are you selling? I think we just hit the legal, like what are you selling LLC versus assets? Um, part two is the existential, the what is it? Um, and this this is really where I think you have to answer this for your own business. Um, and this is going to help narrow down the types of buyers that are interested. So um, some of the what's are, maybe you're selling a distillery that's basically a bar or a tourist destination. Um, I think we've all been to these type of operations where they generate most of their revenue by selling cocktails or selling bottles to people that walk in the door. Um, it's a great business model, high margins. Um, you know, you really interact with your customers directly. You can drive your own marketing directly. Um, but that, you know, that's a business model that's very specific. And the type of person that wants to run that is similar to someone who would want to run a bar or a restaurant or some sort of, you know, facing the public type of business. Uh, the other, another type of distillery that that you might be selling that's very different is the production focused distillery that's essentially a factory where you're you know you're making spirits you're bottling them you're boxing them up giving them to a wholesaler and they're going out to stores and uh accounts all over the place and that you know you may never see your end customer you may not need to see your end customer um in the extreme example there um and that's you know the buyer for that's going to be very different that buyer is going to be more of a you know, manufacturing focused type buyer. Um, someone who's looking to run a manufacturing company is different than someone who wants to run a restaurant. And then, you know, obviously there's can be blends. Most most distillers probably fall in the middle and have components of each of these. Um, but the third one that you could be is really just this type of where you're a brand or, a, you know, an NDP, a non-distiller producer, where you may not even have a large facility that looks like a distillery. You may just be in an office kind of ordering product, having it co-packed somewhere, having it labeled, having it sent out under your name. And you're really there, you know, what your value is built around the brand itself and around building brand recognition and having, um, you know, something that distributors can get behind and that gets people excited. So I think if you're, if you're in that category, it's really, that, that to me is the most variable, you know, it's some, some people would see a brand and say, Hey, that's not worth anything because I could go, you know, set up an account and start another one tomorrow and compete. Um, other brands, you would say, hey, how would you ever compete with that brand? It's so well-established. It's you know so unique and it might be worth the time. So I think there's just a huge amount of variability there and it's, it's hard to nail down the value of those. And we'll talk in a minute about how to value these businesses. Um, but out of the three, I think valuing the, the one that's really just a brand is almost the hardest. Um, and I'm sure we can all think of examples of each of these, but, um, you know, that, those are kind of the buckets I see distilleries falling into. So, and I think the, you know, the other thing to think about on what is we've established kind of, you know, what we're selling in terms of what kind of operation is it? And that starts to point to who might want to buy it. Um, but then there's also beyond that, there's the story that you're going to tell and the story you tell really is what's going to hook in a buyer and, and either get them excited or not. So these are kind of some of the considerations around the story of what you're selling. Um, and these are things the buyer's going to ask. Um, and I think anytime you know a buyer's going to ask a question, the more you can have thought about it in your mind and have your thoughts together and be able to give them a good, well thought out answer, that's, that's going to be the best. Um, so one thing they're going to ask, obviously, is, is your business profitable? Am I going to be able as a buyer to step in as a new owner and sustain this and make a profit and you know pay myself, pay my pay your employees that I'm taking over? Um, if a business isn't profitable, you're ultimately there's a good chance you're just going to be trying to sell off your equipment and inventory. You know, that was ultimately my, you know, my scenario where I my business was pro depending on how you played with the numbers, it, it was profitable some days, not others. So it was kind of right on that fence. And uh, that's why I spent two years looking for someone who who would see a path to to buy it and keep it going, but ultimately, you know, ended up just selling the equipment and the inventory for what they were worth. Um, but the actual operating business, you know, went away, um, which I think is is very common in this industry. That you know, if you're not making a profit, it's often hard to see how you would get to making a profit without investing a ton more money, which some buyers aren't willing to do. 
And so you end up saying, well, what's what's this worth? This box of things, this still and equipment and you know barrels and bottled spirits and what's it worth? You know, the I the intellectual property. You might have a mailing list that's worth something, customer list. Um, but sometimes that package is what you end up selling just for what it's worth. Um, the the next one, do you own or lease your real estate? This is going to be important um, for a lot of reasons. Obviously, you know. If you're leasing, you don't want to have a lease that expires in six months because the buyer's going to know that that's going to be their problem. If they close today and have to negotiate a new lease in six months, they're not going to want to do that. Um, it's not ideal. Um, if you own the building, on the other hand, that and you're trying to sell it as part of the business, that increases the cost because now they've got to buy the business from you and the building from you. Um, often, if you do own the building, we'll see, um, see those split up where you won't sell the building. You'll just become a landlord and lease the building to the buyer after they buy your business. Um, it's important to just kind of be upfront with everyone. Hey, here's our real estate situation. Um, make sure it's part of the discussion early on. Um, growth trajectory is huge. Um, growth trajectory is the thing that can make your business sellable, even if you're not profitable. If you say, hey, we're not profitable yet, but you know we're on a trajectory where our revenue is increasing. And you know if things keep going this way, we'll be very profitable in two years. That might be a story that, that gets someone excited and is will make them willing to, to pull a trigger. So that's important to talk about, you know, where you started, where you're at, you know, what you think the future looks like. Um, your team, super important. Um, do you have people in place who can do the day-to-day -day grind? Do you have someone that does sales? Do you have someone that runs the tasting room? Do you have the production covered? Or are you doing all these things yourself? Um, and, you know, if you need to step away from the business and sell it, is that going to leave someone else signing up for 80 hour work weeks, you know, for the foreseeable future. So that's just important to, to nail down and be upfront about it um, with the buyer. And, and I think the buried question there is you have a team, will they actually stay? Or, you know, is your team all your buddies? And if they don't like the buyer, they're going to go do something else. Or is it a team that's really committed and uh, likely to stay around? Uh, sales mix is important. Um, you know, I think breaking down for a buyer, your mix of on-premise versus off-premise sales is, is key. You know, who are your customers? Uh, though, you know, are you selling a lot of one product like a Tito's where they, they have Tito's vodka and that's it and they sell a ton of it? Or are you spreading a portfolio of products out like a Sazerac where they've got Fireball and Buffalo Trace and Pappy and all, all their various brands and they spread it out over all of them? Um, different buyers are going to want different things. Some people want one or the other. Some people won't care. They just want to know, you know, is, is one of your brands carrying the load? Do you have a nice mix? Um, it's important to, to think through. And I think that also points to who are your customers. You know, if you have a mix, you probably have a mix of customers buying a mix of products, which less risky, less concentration. Um, but if you have an all-star product, that can be really great too. Um, I think the last one I have on here is uh, whether you, what you do in-house versus outsourcing. Um, if someone's buying a distillery, you know, maybe they want to be hands-on making product from scratch in-house. Um, maybe they're really more the brand person and they they want to just focus on the branding and the sales side of it. Um, and then there's all the little things. Are you doing your HR in-house or are you paying someone to do that? And is it the most efficient way to do it or not? Packaging in-house. Do you do distribution yourself? Um, so I think just breaking those down for a buyer um, is something that they'll they'll want to know. So the more you can have a clear answer to that question, the better. And then uh, one that I didn't put on the list, but I think is super important to buyers and especially right now is whether you're buying your business will be financeable for them, whether they will be able to get you know, a loan to buy your business, whether they'll be able to attract um, outside investors if that's what they need to do, um, which I think telling this story in a way that is appealing to someone, the better you tell this story, the more likely it is to be financeable by a bank. Um, but in some cases, the bank's just going to say no. And that's going to really limit the pool of buyers because now you're looking for someone who can write a check out of their pocket, um, which is less people than those who could go get a loan for 80% of the price and only have to cover 20. Um, and, and I think you know we'll talk a little bit more about how to structure these deals in a second. But I think similarly think about, are you is it financeable? And are you willing to help with the financing? Can you hold a seller note, can you finance part of the sale by taking some of the payment over time from the buyer instead of needing it all today? So the next slide is going to get into, um, still kind of talking about what your business is, but this is what's it worth. You know, 
putting a number on a value for your business. And we've hit some of this already. I've talked about some of the things that will affect the value, um, but it, it really is an art, not a science. Um, and this is where I think bringing in an outside professional is, is essential. You know, an investment banker or business broker can really sit down, look at your business and, and help to at least give you a range of what a likely sale price would be. Um, and even if you're not selling, if you're just bringing in investors or some other transaction, you need to establish what your business is worth at that point in time so that it's fair going forward. You say, hey, I, I got the business to be worth X, you know, and that's where we're going to start from, from today. Um, so the baseline for most buyers that are looking at a business, um, especially if they're in that financial buyer category, is they're going to say, how much money does it make? And they're going to apply a multiple to that. So they're going to want to know after all the expenses, after everyone's paid, um, including you, if, if you're acting as the manager, acting as the chief distiller, whatever role you're taking, they're going to say, what if I have to pay another person to do that after the seller leaves? Um, they're going to figure that out. That's the free cash flow, the cash that comes out of the business every year. Um, and they're going to multiply that annual free cash flow by a number. And it's usually a mid to mid single digit to low double digit number, you know, five to 11 maybe is the number that they're multiplying your cash flow by. And that will give you a sale price. Um, I would temper your expectations and say that low end of that is much more likely than the high end. Um, you know, four or five times cash flow is much more believable than to say, hey, I'm going to go out and sell my craft distillery for, you know, 15 times cash flow. Uh, that's unlikely. That's in, the, in this industry. But, um, but so the one caveat there is if your cash flow negative, if you're losing money, um, this doesn't work. You get, you get to a negative value. Um, and a lot of distilleries are losing money even when they're successful, um, especially, you know, I say here, early stage whiskey distilleries, you are focused on putting whiskey in barrels, which is not generating any cash for years, four or five, six years, whatever. Um, that's good. You're, you're putting away valuable stock, but it's not going to show up on your cash flow. So for those type of businesses, you have to kind of do some, some different math and figure out you know, what's it worth the fact that I've established this pipeline that I put away this inventory um, and do a little different math. It's much more complicated, but I think that is, you know, one caveat for those type of distilleries that are really focused on creating a future cash flow stream, but not seeing it now. Um, and then I think a lot of people have an urge to say, yeah, well, cash flow times a multiple, but then also the value of my equipment and my inventory, we're going to add that. And generally, a buyer is going to resist doing that. They're going to say, no, you know, you need that equipment to earn that cash flow so that, you know, that's the value includes the value of that equipment. Um, I think when we start talking about barreled inventory or even bottled inventory that's ready to sell, that's, that's a little more arguable whether you could get that included as a value. So um, some of that's negotiation. Some of it, you're really just, you know, how bad do they want to buy the business versus how bad do you need to sell it? But that, these are things that move around. Um, as I said earlier, if you've got a growth trajectory that looks amazing, that's going to justify selling for a higher multiple for a higher value because that buyer knows, Hey, I'm buying it here today, but if things keep going the way they are, it's going to be, you know, much better tomorrow. Um, so they'll, they'll factor that into their offer price. Um, and then again, at the bottom, you know, I mentioned earlier, these ego driven buyers who aren't acting like a normal, rational, strategic buyer or a, Financial buyer, they're acting like a guy who really wants to own a distillery and tell his friends about it and, you know, take his whiskey and pour it at a party. Um, and for certain people, that's worth a lot of money. And they'll happily buy a business that is, you know, break even or, or losing a little money and enjoy running that business in that way, even, you know, even if it's not making them financial um, returns. So if you if you find one of those folks, um, that can be the real uh, the real way to, you know, see a bigger return than, than you would expect from one of these businesses. And the next slide, we'll talk about uh, just the fact that, you know, we are in 2023. It's been a heck of a year. Um, you know, in my day-to-day -day work, we've seen a big slowdown generally in businesses being bought and sold. Um, I think that's no different in distilleries. Like, Anybody that's looking to buy a business right now is going to be more cautious, be more conservative than they would have been two years ago when interest rates were low. Um, so some market current conditions just to think about 
and to, to think about how to get creative around, um, number one, interest rates are high, um, which just makes everything else more expensive because money's more expensive. So if I'm you know, taking out a loan to buy your business, that loan's going to cost me more. So I have to pay less for your business. Um, so that's, you know, just something that you have to accept right now. If you can wait till rates come down, great. If you find a bank that you have a great relationship with and they're willing to make a special sweetheart deal for your buyer, you can make that introduction. That's amazing. Um, as, as we mentioned earlier, if you can do some seller financing where you, you act as the bank, and you you know take some of the payment over time and your interest rates lower than the market, um, that can help. Um, another option is earnouts, which is basically where you're saying, hey, you know, we're going to sell for this price, and I'm going to get paid a, a good chunk of that now, but um, some of that I'm only going to get when you hit certain milestones. So if you really think, hey, my distillery sales are going great, sales are going to go up 20% each of the next two years, you might have an earnout that says, look, I'm going to get paid half the price now. And then if we hit that 20% growth next year, I'm going to get another 25%. And if I hit the 20% growth the next year, I'm going to get another 25%. And uh, the risk there is you've given up control. So you're hoping that the new buyer, the new operator continues to see that growth, but you're showing them, hey, I've got faith in this. I'm not just trying to take all my money and run. I really believe you're buying a good business. And that can that can bridge that gap on uh, valuation sometimes. Um, another, you know, Feather in the cap of selling a distillery right now, something that makes it a little better is that the industry is matured. Um, when I was starting out, there were, you know, a few hundred maybe craft distilleries in the country and it was weird and no one knew what it was and banks laughed at you and it was just not a proven industry. Um, especially, in, like I said, in New Jersey, it was very unproven. That no one had been doing it. Um, some states were further along, some were further behind. But in any case now, um, even nationwide, everyone has some experience, some you know traction, some track record, and it's easier to explain to banks, to buyers, to everyone that hey, this is a real business, this has got long-term runway, this can grow. Um, you can point to other big sales of distilleries and say, look, they did it. Here's how they did it. I'm following a similar path, um, and that's really helpful to to just have that um, industry that's more mature. Um, on the flip side of that. There's a lot more distilleries now. So if someone's actively looking to buy one, they may actually have options. They may be able to look at two or three and and buy the one they really want, as opposed to, you know, if you wanted to buy a distillery, you know, 10 years ago, um, you may have just had one or two. And if, if you wanted one, you had to play ball. Um, I will flag uh, the craft beer industry. I think we all probably see a lot, a lot of intersection between distilling and brewing. Um, it's often seen as like a leading indicator there, you know, 20 or 30 years older in terms of an industry. Um, obviously there's a ton of nuance, a ton of differences, but it's worth looking at them. And it's worth seeing that a lot of craft breweries are having a rough time right now. Um, the industry's gotten big, it's gotten super competitive. And there's been a lot of um, companies falling out, either being sold, being kind of um, conglomerated or just going out of business altogether. And I will say that at least in my region, where I have a closest the closest eye on the brewing world, um, I see mostly closures. Um, I don't see a lot of breweries saying, hey, we want to sell, some, come buy us. I've seen some on the market. I haven't seen a lot of those deals close and get done. Um, but I have seen a lot of, hey, our lease is up. We're going to close. We're just going to walk away. Um, big big party at the end, usually. Um, they try to make the most of the last few, uh, few months of operation. But that seems to be what the breweries are doing, um, at least around here, is if they are, if they're in trouble, if they're not, you know, financially sustainable, they tend to just kind of peter out um, whenever something like a, an end of a lease or some other event kind of gives them that decision point. Um, and then I will say, look, as much as I just doom and gloomed on the market for uh, acquisitions right now, a lot of the big players who we've seen buy up craft distillers, um, you know, the big international spirits companies, they have tons of cash, um, just like a lot of big companies. They hoarded cash during the pandemic uh, when money was cheap. And uh, you'll see here some of the numbers. I think these are end of the third quarter numbers for Diageo and Pernod and Constellation and Brown Foreman. They're sitting on millions, if not you know, a billion plus dollars of cash, um, which I think generally they like to use that cash to go out and acquire businesses, um, whether they're acquiring craft distillers or something else. Um, 
who knows, you know, a lot of them play in beer, a lot of them are starting to play in cannabis. But I think, you know, if, if you're attractive to one of those companies, they can still do a deal and they will still do a deal. So little silver lining there. Um, and then uh, the last thing we'll talk about is how to sell. Um, you know, what are the mechanics of actually executing one of these transactions? Um, so we've decided that you're going to sell. You, you've thought about why you're selling, you know, kind of what you're selling. And uh, now we're going to go to how. This is also very much not one size fits all. So I'm going to give you a basic idea, um, basic framework. But I think, you know, we will need to tweak this to match your specific scenario. Um, so I like to say it's a team sport selling a business. Um, you know, as an attorney here, I tend to play on these teams and work with these other teammates all the time. So I very much see the importance of treating it as a team sport. Um, you're going to want, you know, first and foremost, an accountant. Hopefully you already have one, you know, distilling is a business and it's a business with kind of unusual cash flows in and out, some unusual inventory that you're keeping for a long time, um, a lot of regulatory stuff. So hopefully you have a good accountant. Um, if you don't, I can't recommend highly enough that you get one ASAP. Um, and as far as selling, the accountant's going to do a lot of the legwork of getting your numbers and your books into a presentable format, something you can show to buyers and they'll get their head quickly around what your business looks like. Super important. Um, and honestly, it's important to have those finance financials in a good format and presentable before you talk to the next person, the business broker or an iBanker. Um, you'll see these two terms, business broker, investment banker. Um, it's kind of a bifurcated world. They do the same thing, but business brokers tend to work with smaller businesses, um, maybe revenue under a couple million bucks. Um, investment bankers tend to work with bigger businesses that are doing, um, you know, probably not revenue, but income over, over a couple million bucks. Um, so it's, you know, depending on your size, you'll find the right fit. And regardless of what they call themselves, um, their role is really to package your business and present it to buyers. Um, they're going to put together a slideshow. They're going to put together a bunch of presentation materials. Hopefully they know a lot of people who are interested in buying businesses. Generally, um, if you can find someone in the specific industry, they might know people specifically in the beverage or consumer products or, you know, bar restaurant worlds that would be good buyers. And they're going to go out and do that legwork of talking to those people, telling them about your business, getting them excited. And then negotiating some of the big points around, you know, what's it worth? What's the deal? Um, and then last on the list is someone like me, an attorney, um, who is going to really help you nail down the nuts and bolts of the sale, help you to um, get all the pieces in place for a smooth transition. Um, and really, I think most importantly, help you look out for risks and problems that you may not initially think of. Um, as I said earlier, attorneys are always looking for these risks that may never happen, but if they do, um, you're going to be glad you you know have it in that document. It says says what the plan is. You have a plan in place. Um, I always think for these business sale transactions, it's good to work with a firm with a number of specialists. Um, you're going to run into tax issues every time. If you have employees, you're going to run into employment issues. Um, if you have IP, like you own brands and copyrights, there's all that licensing and IP issues. Distilled spirits. A lot of what I do is the regulatory stuff state, the federal TTB, where you're transferring licenses, you're transferring the people who are on the hook for your bonds. Um, a lot of that is pretty specialized. And then just the business transaction in general is a very specialized M&A um, type transaction. And so very rare to find one attorney who can or should be allowed to do all of those. So good to find a group who can, you know, work together cohesively and, and you know, make sure all your bases are covered and make it look seamless to you so that you don't have to chase down 10 different people. Um, and I will say, if you already, you know, if you already work with an accountant, an attorney, um, you probably don't work with a business broker unless you're thinking of selling. But if you have an accountant who you've had for years or an attorney who you've worked with, um, it's always good to let them know early that, hey, I'm thinking of selling. Even if it's just early thoughts, hey, I'm thinking I might want to get out of this business. Let them know early. They can flag things that they know will be problematic. So you can start fixing those as soon as possible. Um, and I know from my perspective, it's always nice to be involved, even if I'm in the background and I'm not talking to the other side. If you're negotiating with a buyer and maybe doing a letter of intent, really early stage negotiations, it's nice for me to have a look at that and to flag legal issues that might be worth covering in that letter of intent before you agree to it. 
because if you sign a letter of intent with a bunch of terms that you guys hashed out, um, it's hard to go back on those. It doesn't look good to go back on those, even if it's a non-binding letter of intent, it's better to have had it right from the start. Um, so I always say, you know, don't hesitate to get your professionals involved early in the process. Um, I know you start to think they're going to charge you money and the, the clock is ticking and you don't want to run up those bills, but it can very much be worth it. And it's, you know, if that's the concern, have that conversation, say, Hey, how do we prevent me from running up a bill, but also make sure I'm getting good advice early on. Um, yeah. And then, you know, obviously shop around, look for people, ask for referrals, find people that, you know, you work, you will work well with that understand your business and are willing to put in the, uh, the grunt work to, to help you have your sale um, be as successful as possible. And my last slide is, uh, it says, who's ready for a drink? Um, I know this was in like Pacific time. So I'm just drinking water because it's still very early on the West Coast. But uh, I would love q and A. I have to figure out if I can see the q and I'm going to play around. You may lose the slideshow here. Um, but I will check the chat box. Let's see. I don't see any Q and A over there, but if anyone has questions, Put it in chat. throw it into the the chat, um, and I'm happy to answer. And if not, you can obviously reach out to me um, at your leisure. Um, I will throw the screen share back up, which has the contact info. I am happy to be a resource if you're thinking about doing any of this um, business buying, selling in the distilled spirits world, or if you just, you know, have questions, feel free to reach out. All good. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Um, like I said, if any questions come up after this, feel free to shoot me an email, give me a call. Uh, my info's right there and I'll uh, best of luck with all your distilling. Thanks. Thanks.